Good morning. Welcome to all of you who've gathered here despite the rain. Welcome to those of you who are joining us online. Wherever you are, whoever you are, however you identify, whomever you love, wherever you find yourself on this journey of faith, you are welcome here. We start our worship with some announcements from the community, and I've got quite a list, so I know we are into the busy church season, and there's lots of ways to uh, join in and engage and learn and grow. You're invited to coffee after the service. We've often been having it in the front lawn, but today it's going to be in the lower hall, so file through those doors and follow your nose, I guess. You'll find the coffee and, and tea and uh, cookies there. Next Sunday is a special service. We are worshiping at Chalmers United Church at 10.30. So we won't be here, we'll be at Chalmers United at 10.30. It's a joint service for three congregations, Chalmers, Faith, and Sydenham Street. And it will be led by members of the Joint Truth and Reconciliation Action Group. The focus of the service is Every Child Matters, and you're invited to wear orange, in honor of Orange Shirt Day and Canada's second National Day of Truth and Reconciliation. And following the service, this, we're going to enjoy maple, blueberry, bannock, and strawberry tea. On the following Friday, September 30th, you're invited to visit Sydenham Street, where the sanctuary will be open for two hours, from 11 o'clock to 1 o'clock. So everyone who wishes may light a candle and take quiet time to remember the tragedies of the past, the pains that many adults and children still carry today as a consequence of residential schools, and to pray for a different future, one where all who share the land we know as Canada live in peace with justice and love. Also next Sunday, September 25th, is our congregational meeting. So we'll be joining at Chalmers um, and then coming back here for our congregational meeting after the service. Um, and one final announcement is that for the, excuse me, for the small group ministries, there's going to be sign-ups available at the uh, welcome table after the service and in the lower hall after the service. So if you'd like to sign up for a small group ministry, there will be sheets to do that um, over coffee following the service. So I'm sure there's things I've forgotten. We're an active group, and your best source of information is our weekly newsletter that goes out on Fridays. Email the office to join, or our website. So please follow us and check it out. Every time we gather for worship, we acknowledge the land upon which we gather. And in this season of creation, I've um, varied from the land acknowledgement that you find on the front of the bulletin and today I'm going to offer one that was prepared by Pat Roebuck. She is a member of the Land Council and a volunteer with Walking the Path of Peace Together, which is a ministry of our sister congregation, Faith. We're going to hear more about that in the service. So this, these are Pat's words as she's created a land acknowledgement based on the Haudenosaunee words before all else. We are on the traditional territories of the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples, who have cared for this land for millennia. As we continue our series on creation, I got to thinking about what I've learned from indigenous people's perspectives on our relationship to the land. Relationship is the key word. We are part of creation. We are related to all of creation, and as such, we have a responsibility to care for it. Some of you may have heard the Haudenosaunee Thanksgiving address, the words before all else. It's a long address which is often spoken before a meeting or event, giving thanks and acknowledging all aspects of the world around us, focusing our thoughts with the repeated refrain, and now our minds are one. So today, as we acknowledge the land and those who have been here long before settlers, may we also recognize that we are part of all creation and give thanks for the earth, waters, fish, plants, animals, trees, winds, sun, moon, and stars. The words before all else end with these words. Now we turn our thoughts to the creator or great spirit 
and send greetings and thanks for all the gifts of creation. Everything we need to live a good life is here on this Mother Earth. For all the love that is still around us, we gather our minds together as one and send our choicest words of greetings and thanks to the Creator. Now our minds are one. As Pat mentioned, we continue our Creation Time series focused on themes of ecological justice and reconciliation. And today we're going to look at the second story of creation, the second creation narrative from the book of Genesis, a familiar story about Adam and Eve, but I hope we can see it through new eyes as we read it with an environmental lens and see what this ancient passage has to teach us about living with respect in creation. I invite you to rise in body or spirit for our call to worship printed in your bulletin. All who dwell in time and space, sun and moon and all creation, hallelujah, hallelujah. Join together in singing praise. Number 240 in the hard cover hymn book, Voices United. Praise my soul, the God of heaven.
Hamilton. We light two candles today. The first represents the light of Christ, a light I feel like we can use on a gloomy morning like today, a light that guides our footsteps in the path of peace and justice. And we light a second candle, which represents our prayers, our prayers for peace in all places of conflict. We move into a time of prayer now, centering our hearts and minds in music, and I'll follow that with a prayer and a time for silent prayer. So let us move into a space of prayer. Holy God, we recall the creation account of how you formed us from the dust of the earth and breathed life into our very being. Then set us in a garden of beauty and plenty. Throughout the generations, you have spoken to us through scripture and the church, reminding us you are dust and to dust you shall return. Forgive us when we have taken for granted or treated with carelessness the gift of life in us and all creation. When we have forgotten that we are not above or separate from, but a very part of the land and water and web of life that surrounds and sustains us. In the silence now, breathe into us gratitude and new life. As children turn to a mother who watches over them, let us turn to God saying, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Friends, we make mistakes. We squander opportunities and resources. We take each other and this precious world for granted. And yet, a creative force for goodness and justice and peace persists. Repairing relationships forgiving mistakes, making all things new. For the grace and mercy of God's Spirit, let us give thanks and praise. Amen. As children of that Spirit, we bless each other with signs of peace, sharing in the peace of Christ. Used to be with a handshake, 
and now we've got alternatives. So let's turn to one another and pass the peace, pass that blessing on. In advance of our invitation to the offering, Ken is going to offer kind of a heritage moment for us, a bit of a story of the um, congregations to share at this time. So I'll invite Ken forward to do that, please. Thank you, Catherine. Um, there are a lot of stories that revolve around this wonderful building and this wonderful space. Um, I could not tell you all about them. I would mention that uh, when doors open uh, in Kingston occurs on the 24th of September, that's next Saturday, you'll have a chance to come and be toured around the building and find things about those stories. But there's one that's particularly pertinent this week and this past week because of the events in the United Kingdom and around the world, <clears throat> and that is to do with King, uh, the, uh, the death of uh, Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. And this story revolves around her visit here. So I'm going to read it, uh, and some, some of you will know about it, many of you will know about it, but I find, I'm finding in general that there are always some people that have not heard this story, and I think it's worth telling. It was early 1959, and plans were being made for Queen Elizabeth to visit Canada to open the brand new St. Lawrence Seaway near Cornwall. One evening, when Reverend Davidson, the minister of Sydenham Street United Church, answered a knock at the manse door, that's the next building over is the manse, no longer a manse, he found himself face to face with a royal tour official who informed him that the king, I'm sorry, that the queen and Prince Philip would like to attend worship at a large, non-conformist, cathedral-like church with a reputation for good music. Gosh, where could that be? <laughs> And he was then asked if Sydney Street United Church would be willing to be that church. The answer was a quick and responding yes. The date was set for June 28, 1959, two days after the official Seaway opening. Music director Dr. F.R.C. Clark composed a special anthem which the choir began to rehearse. CBC Radio decided to live broadcast the service 
Among those who tuned in across the country were Dr. Clark's parents, who were delighted to hear their son, Fred, play for the Queen. Ushers drew lots to determine who among them would have the honour of ushering during this royal service. Long-time and still active church member Mary Leroy was the 12-year-old daughter of one of those ushers. She remembers the thrill of sitting near the royal couple and recalls that when he read scripture, Prince Philip spoke with the most wonderful voice. An estimated 1,200 people attended the service. We're, we, we planned for 850 here, so just get an idea of what it must have looked like. If you filled everything here, 850 today, 1,200 that day. Don't know where they all fitted. Church members were guaranteed a ticket, and local religious and political leaders received invitations. People were more than happy to squeeze into any available space to see Queen Elizabeth II. The front pew in which Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip sat was later commemorated with two brass plaques. For those of you that have two minutes at the end of the service, the two plaques are here in this small pew right here where many of us have sat, and where actually I sat when my daughter was married here in 1995. So I wasn't the king or the queen or anything, but I felt very honored to sit there. <laughs> Um, in the decades that have followed, the royal pew has welcomed parents of the groom at dozens of weddings and families of the deceased at countless funerals. A collection of photos and a certificate confirming the royal visit are on display near the front doors through which Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip entered Sydenham Street United Church on June 28, 1959. That area is back through there in what is currently the narthex and is becoming the spire gallery. It is not fully complete yet, but the portion that has the Queen's visit in it uh, is still displayed there by the pictures, and I'd welcome your chance, or would, would encourage you, if you haven't seen them, to just nip back there for a few minutes and just see it. In any case, um, I'm pleased to have offered this heritage moment to you. A few things I wanted to clarify about that story. I do not live in the mansion next door, <laughs> which is sadly no longer the manse. And secondly, I think we all hear that story, um, you know, with a, a, it's kind of quaint and, and a wonderful memory, and I hear it as a nightmare for a preacher. <laughs> Someone knocks on your door and tells you the queen is coming on Sunday. <laughs> but thank you, Ken, for highlighting that. And inspired by that uh, legacy of faith in this place, but looking ahead with eyes of hope and anticipation to what God is still doing and going to do in the future here, we commit ourselves to God's ministry in this place. We commit through our finances, but also through our care and compassion, our prayers, our song, um, our time and effort. And so we're going to ask God's blessing upon all that we offer together. So let us pray our dedication of our offering. Multiply our efforts by your grace, God of love, so that the needs of a hurting and lonely planet may be met, and all will know that they are cared for, each creature, each ocean, the sky and the land, people everywhere, will know that they are a valued and beloved part of your creation. Strengthen us as we give and receive within your community of love and mutual support. Amen. Our next hymn is The Lone Wild Bird, and this was a, a request of Michael Dentz, one of his favorite hymns. Um, I will likely sing it again. It may be somewhat new to you, but I know it's familiar to the choir, and its uh, lyrics really are grounded in creation. So let's stand together as we sing Voices United 384, The Lone Wild Bird.
we hear of that life-giving breath in our scripture reading today from Genesis chapter 2. reading today is from chapter, chapter 2 of Genesis, and I'm reading from the 1970 translation of the New English Bible, starting with the second half of verse number 4. When the Lord God made earth and heaven, there was neither shrub nor plant growing wild upon the earth, because the Lord God had sent no rain on the earth, nor was there any man to till the ground. A flood used to rise out of the earth and water all the surface of the ground. Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils a breath of life. Thus the man became a living creature. Then the Lord God planted a garden in Eden away from the east, and there he put a man whom he had formed, put the man he had formed. The Lord God made trees spring from the ground, all trees pleasant to look at and good for food. And in the middle of the garden, he set the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to till it and care for it. He told the man, you may eat from every tree in the garden, but not from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For on the day that you eat from it, you will certainly die. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. God. I invite Howard Ford to introduce the choir's anthem. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to worship this morning. It's my pleasure to introduce our first anthem of the year. And it's kind of interesting how uh, its history coincides with our current state of affairs in the world. The anthem is called Blue Blue Green Hills of Earth. It was originally composed in 1982. That was last century, believe it or not as a hymn for the Paul Winter Consort's Misa Gaia, or Mass for Mother Earth, perfect for this time of creation. It has since become a staple hymn in some of the largest churches in the U.S. and cathedrals. It was chosen by, interestingly, the Gostel Radio Youth Chorus in Moscow and the San Francisco Boys Choir in San Francisco. Simultaneously, it was broadcast via, sil- via satellite in the Beyond War Space Bridge of December 1984. This was the first civilian space bridge in history dedicated, ironically, to peace between the two countries. Ladies and gentlemen, the Sydenham Street United Church where?
And the people say, Amen. Will you pray with me? Holy God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be in keeping with the message that you have for each one of us this day, a message of good news through Jesus Christ. Amen. A little forest can go a long way. That's the motivating impulse behind a movement called Tiny Forests. Behind the tiny forest that volunteers have planted out on Highway 15 as part of the Highway 15 Indigenous Food Sovereignty Garden. You'll remember that our sister congregation, where I'm also in ministry, Faith United Church, has partnered with Indigenous leaders to repatriate this land on Highway 15 and to create a place of healing, teaching, and reconciliation for generations to come. So volunteers with the garden over the last couple years have taken steps to regenerate the soil and grow a forest in addition to other projects, gardening-based and learning-based projects. But this tiny forest involved first uh, regenerating the soil by laying down cardboard and mulch and straw. There were other steps. And then volunteers from all over planted over 1,000 native species of plants and trees, mostly trees and shrubs. Now a great effort has been to keep it watered until this tiny forest gets established. They're following it in an innovative Japanese method that can grow mature forests about 10 times faster than usual. So Japanese botanist Akira Miyawaki developed this method of forest gen- regeneration, particularly with urban and suburban areas in mind. So the trees are planted closer together in a small plot of land. Miyawaki found that the plants compete so hard for nourishment, for sunlight, for water, that they grow a lot faster than if you planted them singly far apart. So rather than needing about 200 years to grow a mature forest, with this method it takes just about 20 years. Little forests can reach maturity quickly. They can thrive in small spaces. So they're really an exciting tool in uh, re-greening urban spaces and addressing urban issues of air quality and heat. So usually in forestry practices, trees were deliberately planted far apart to avoid competition because that was understood when they had enough sunlight and water that they would survive and thrive. But that fit an older idea that trees don't have communal relationships and will do better if they're on their own getting their own piece of the pie. Scientific studies over the past couple of decades have found that forests are intelligent woodland communities. Intelligent woodland communities. Their members are connected underground by a vast botanical nervous system made up of thready fungal roots. One scientist who's been studying this, Suzanne Simard, says that trees interact more like a community with values. She's found that trees value having neighbors, nurturing multiple species and sharing resources among species. Trees have memory. They can learn. They sacrifice their own well-being for that of others. They recognize kin. As Joyce Hostin, the co-founder of Little Forest Kingston, she said recently on a CBC radio interview, trees just don't thrive in isolation. They need community just like us. And the exciting thing about the Little Forest movement, as she points out, is that when we seek to regenerate the soil and grow a little forest, we find that a community of people grows too. Growing a community of trees fosters the growth of a community of people around it who are nurturing it. 
And that has certainly been shown to be true in the case of the Highway 15 project, in which school groups and corporate partners and volunteers from all across the city have banded together to restore that soil, to plant the trees, and to nurture these native species. So in that way, it's a project of healing and growth, healing the soil, growing a forest, and healing and growing as communities. Our relationship to each other and to the land are a central theme of our scripture today, which is the second creation narrative in the book of Genesis. Now, in the second story, we hear in, in some more detail and sometimes contradictory detail an additional account of God's creation of the universe and, and all that populates it. Now, I love that our Bible begins with two slightly contradictory stories, just in case you were tempted to take it a little too literally. The text reminds us in its very being, the truth of this story is not necessarily in its factual accuracy. The truth is what it tells us about who we are and about who God is and how we are meant to be. In the days that God made the earth and heavens, there was no vegetation, only a spring from which water flowed over the earth. Then God formed a human being from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And this man became a living being. God planted a garden called Eden and placed this person in it. It was beautiful and there was plenty of food. And God said, help yourself to anything except the fruit of that one tree. I don't know if there's any parents out there, but if you took a box of toys and placed them in front of my toddler and said, you can play with any of these except this one, any mother would tell you that's the one she's going to want to play with. You need to put that fruit up on the shelf and close the door and hide it. So I feel like, you know, this was God's first child, maybe a rookie mistake. God should have known better. Because we know what follows, we know what happened. God creates woman, and together, Adam and Eve, they eat the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and they are cast out from this garden of plenty and abundance. This story is incredibly rich with meaning, and literally millennia of scholarship have mined it for that meaning, and we can read it through different um, frameworks, through literary criticism or feminism. Today, I'd like to look at it through the lens of environmentalism, of kind of eco-justice or eco-spirituality, to see what it has to say to us about our relationship with the environment. Well, if we read it from that perspective, first, we notice that we are not separate from, but actually made of the stuff of creation. We are made from the soil, from the land. So there is this oneness, this connection from beginning to end. In this same story, a little bit later, God reminds us, you are dust, and to dust you shall return. A humbling reminder that we, as Christians for generations, have repeated on Ash Wednesday, and at graveside funerals. A reminder that we are inextricably connected to the land from the beginning of our life to its end. Then, as we consider this creation narrative with an eye to land and soil and the environment, we see that the great sin of humanity is our inability to live in harmony in the Garden of Eden. We had enough food to sustain us, but it wasn't enough. We had what we needed, but we wanted to take just a little bit more. Now we start to see the truth at the heart of our creation story, because this echoes our own reality. It rings true to Western culture in which enough is never enough, and more is always better. So in the story, the consequence of taking more than we need from the land, the consequence of greed, is broken relationship. 
God proclaims that this original sin will result in relationships marked by inequality and conflict between people and animals, between women and men. More specific to the land is God's proclamation that Adam will have to toil and labor and work the soil to produce enough to live on. So greed has fractured our relationship with God, with the land, with each other. And we see that theme carried out in the next story in Genesis, the story of Adam and Eve's children, Cain and Abel. Cain, these are two sons, Cain is a farmer and Abel is a shepherd. And out of jealousy, out of ambition, Cain murders Abel. Now what's interesting in this story is that the consequence of that murder on the family is not fully told. Instead, what we hear about the impacts of this murder is how it impacts Cain's relationship with the land. God says, listen, your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground, and now you are cursed from the ground. Cain's punishment includes that he'll be a wanderer. He's no longer going to be rooted to a place and able to farm the land. Cain responds, my punishment is too great for me to bear. Today you've driven me away from the soil, and I shall be hidden from your face. I learned this just this week, that uh, in Hebrew folk etymology, the name Cain means acquisition or production. Sin, then, in this reading of our creation narrative and the story of Cain and Abel, is the greed, the excessive ambition and acquisition the violence that has broken our relationships with each other and our environment. Taking what we don't need, taking another's life. This sin has direct impacts on our relationships with our creator, with each other, and with the land. So how we relate to the land, how we relate to each other, how we relate to each other, how we relate to the land, this is directly connected in one of the most formative stories of our Judeo-Christian tradition. This foundational teaching, I think, should motivate us and inspire us as we seek to relate differently to the land and each other as part of our commitment to climate justice and reconciliation. You know, indigenous academics and leaders and scientists are leading the way. Researcher Jared Gannett at the University of Alberta, he puts it this way, Western frameworks are failing in conservation. We need to start redefining our relationship with the natural world. Generally, indigenous perspectives see that we are more related to that natural world and that we have an obligation to deep stewardship to the land. So in his research in conservation biology, and he's by no means alone, it is an entire movement, Gannett works closely with indigenous communities, seeking to create space for the deep knowledge base that already exists within Indigenous nations, including local people who spend time on the land. Gannett believes this approach also respects reconciliation and resurgence, how Indigenous peoples have been on the land since time immemorial. And and that, as Gannett says, we are still here and know how to live with the wildlife and the landscape in a healthy way. Gannett and many others are leading the way as we seek to decolonize climate policies and environmental practices, to decolonize our relationship with the land and relate differently to each other and to this land that sustains all of us. You know, on the United Church crest, we have, um, it's actually on the back of your bulletin there, we have an important symbolic reminder of our interconnectedness and commitment to decolonization and reconciliation. You'll see there the four colors of the four directions. And since 2012, the United Church Crest has also included the Mohawk phrase, Agwe Nayadewao Neren, translated in English as all my relations. So including that phrase in in our crest, that's an acknowledgement that indigenous people have been a part of the United Church since its founding and continue to be an important part of our church. But it's also a statement of interconnectedness to each other and the whole of creation. You know, as I understand it, the concept of all my relations means that we are related to all parts of creation, 
that the land, the waters, the animals, the plants, these are our relatives. So this phrase is a call to the church to honor all our relations, to commit ourselves to ecological justice, to indigenous rights and reconciliation. On our crest, in our foundational biblical texts, we're reminded that we are deeply connected to creation. We are formed of the earth. We are dust. We are sustained by the land from beginning to end. From beginning to end, we are deeply connected to each other, to the land, and to the God whose life-giving breath animates all. It's that same breath, that same creative spirit that can breathe new life into us still, restoring minds and souls, healing relationships, renewing heaven and earth. Breathe deeply and know that we are not alone on this journey of faith. Amen. We move into a time of prayer in which we lift up the joys and concerns of our hearts. We're going to sing three times through the refrain from More Voices, which is the Coiled Hymn Book. It's number 15, so remain seated as we call upon God to send God's life-giving breath, Holy Sacred Spirit. Clouds rolling across the sea and land, freedom and space to explore, the soothing pattern and rhythm of our days and seasons ground us in the eternal. Tranquility in early morning rising, delight in green surroundings, joyous laughter of friends, all remind us of the wonders of our lives. We give thanks, O God, for the gifts we witness around us in green spaces, in music and creativity, in support, validation, and love in our church communities, in the wisdom of our shared heritage and the wonderful example of Christ. We bring before you, O God, all those in positions of power, that leaders might be guided by wisdom and integrity all cooperating in proper care and concern for the world's resources. Remembering those dedicating their lives to the care of others and all who call out in agony against the oppression of nature. Where difference threatens stability, we pray for understanding and compassion, for peace in our world, renewal of the earth and her resources, that communities might thrive, land and waters recover, and individuals flourish. We pray for grace and compassion to understand the needs of our neighbors, those who live with anxiety and fear. 
people experiencing environmental trauma or oppression. We lift up all for whom life is a daily struggle, coming to terms with disappointing news or wrong choices and their effects, and those who still wait for their needs to be met. We bring silent prayers of our own burdens. In the quiet now, we lift up both those burdens of love and those which lie heavily upon our hearts. We pray for James Smith Cree Nation. We pray for Pakistan. We pray for Ukraine. When we are unsure how to move forward, may Christ's spirit be our guide. Where we fear there can be no hope, may we feel the healing touch of Christ. And when we experience the blessings and beauty of life, may we be moved to recognize their source and sing a song of praise to our maker and creator. Amen. Our closing hymn is that song of praise. It's number 30 in the coiled hymn book, More Voices. It's called A Song of Praise to the Maker. So I invite you to stand as we sing together. Friends, go forth with a song of love and praise, a song of praise to your maker. Go forth knowing that you are a blessing. Go forth to be a blessing to others. And may the grace of Christ, the love of God, and the abiding presence of the Holy Spirit go with you now and always. Amen? Amen. Amen.